very warm welcome to our Perspective Altering Wellbeing Show, where we offer you ways to access your highest levels of energy, vitality, and freedom from dis-ease. Today, Dr. Bruce Lipton takes us from the community of bacteria to the community of amoeba through to the community of humans in a fresh new look at evolution. And then the author of High Energy Happiness and newspaper columnist and life coach Louise Thompson shares her journey from complete adrenal fatigue to, well, high energy happiness. And in a pre-recorded interview, Dr. James Wilson, who authored the Bible on adrenal fatigue, of which every home should have a copy, tells us how to get past that feeling of, I have to have three coffees to even begin to feel awake today. But first, Bruce Lipton, in our pre-recorded series, talks evolution and begins with a fascinating tale of the worm and the genome project. Bruce Lipton, I loved a passage in this book, um, Spontaneous Evolution, about cells and how originally they were uh, all operating individually and then they learned to work together and then they learned to specialise in different areas but still with an idea to working for the whole. Then you leap from that to human um, constructs, to human societies. Tell me that link. Tell me what well, that's about. The link is this. The original belief, you know, uh, you've probably seen it in school. It was called the Tree of Life. It was actually drawn about uh, late 1800s. And it puts all the organisms on this planet in a hierarchy from the most primitive bacteria at the base of the tree to humans at the very top of the tree. And the vision was, well, what is responsible for the hierarchy? What is responsible for your level on that tree versus being a low level and high level? We originally thought it was genetics. That higher organisms in the tree have much more genes and genes were providing for the complexity and the structure and the behavior and all that. So organisms at the top of the tree have much more genes than organisms at the lower bottom of the tree. So evolution was driven by how many genes we have. Well, that whole thing collapsed when the Human Genome Project came in. For the recognition is this. One of the first organisms they did genotyping on to find out how many genes was a, a, a miniature worm. It's, it's about half a, a couple of millimeters at the most, millimeter maybe. 1,271 cells, very small organism. I said, well, how many genes? 20,000 genes, so that's a good starting point, okay? And how many genes did we expect? Scientists had a vision of the number they expected even before they did the human genome, and it was in excess of 100,000 genes, and that would make us at the top of the tree versus the worm at the bottom. So, I love Mother Nature, cosmic jokester is the best. The results of the Human Genome Project come in, and guess how? A human has about 20,000 genes. The same as the, uh, as the smallest one. And all of a sudden, so wait. Wow. Then as you go up the tree, it wasn't necessarily based on genes at all. No, it's not. Well, maybe there shouldn't be a tree, Bruce. Maybe it's all just well, one Well, it's actually big a more like line. a bush than a <laughs> yes. tree because it grows out in all directions at once. So what does it, apart from humbling the human race and our hubris, what yeah. does it tell us? What, what can we learn that from that? Genetics that is not life. the foundation of evolution. Consciousness is the foundation of evolution, meaning at the bottom of the tree, organisms have the least amount of so-called consciousness, and as you go up to the top of the tree, it's an elaborate and expanded consciousness. So that cries out for a definition of consciousness. Yeah. What's yours? And, and see, so consciousness then has to do with the brain. You say, well, what about a single cell organ? And I say, well, a single cell has a brain as well. It obviously has to live in the world and adjust its biology. I say, well, what is it? Well, we used to say the nucleus where the genes are. That whole thing has now disappeared. The nucleus is like a file cabinet with patterns to make the cell. But it doesn't have any information of how to use the patterns, when they should be used, or why they should be used. They're just patterns in a drawer. It turns out the cell membrane, the skin, is the source of the nervous system. I say, well, what relevance to that? And I say, primitive organisms like a bacteria live inside a capsule. There, there's like a matrix, like a skeleton on the outside. So the bacterium could only be so big, it couldn't get any bigger because it's constrained. So I said, well, what's the relevance? I said, well, evolution made the smartest membrane in a bacterium. And then guess what? It ended. Why? I couldn't add any more membrane, make it more intelligent because it's locked inside this capsule. So I said, well, does it mean evolution stopped? I said, for a moment it did because I couldn't make the individual bacterium smarter. But then nature came up with another way. So what if you bring a whole bunch of bacteria together into one membrane? And that's called a biofilm. I say, what was the relevance? Each unit, bacterium, has a certain amount of consciousness. 
But when you put a thousand of them inside the membrane, you have a thousand times the consciousness. Oh, so the first level is make the individual smart. The second level was to make a community of individuals. Well, that community of bacteria became what is called the amoeba. And then the next phase was to make the smartest amoeba possible. And we get to the end. Why? It's a single cell organism with a single membrane around it. It can't get any bigger than a certain size because the membrane would rupture like a balloon with too much water in it, causes the balloon to break. So cells became limited. I said, oh, guess what? Made the smartest amoeba, but I couldn't make it any smarter because if I add more membrane, it gets too big, it's not safe. I said, oh, evolution stop. Smartest amoeba I can make. And then I say, then what happened? Oh, amoebas came together in community. I say, yeah, and I say, every plant and animal that you see on this planet is, by definition, a community of amoebas, including us. We have 50 trillion amoebas. We're a community. I go, yeah, so I create a new organism called the human, which is actually a community of amoebas, and then I say, guess what? Pack that skull with as much brain tissue as you possibly can. And I say, guess what? I can't make any more brain inside a human skull. <gasps> Humans reached the limit of their brain capacity a while back. I say, so what's evolution now? I said, I can't make us any smarter. We maximize the amount of space in that skull. Evolution stop. Next evolution. Same pattern again. You bring humans together to share their awareness. So we are in an evolutionary state right now. What? We've already advanced the human to the fullest level of its ability. And now we're looking for evolution to the next level. And I say, ah, humans are cells that in a community form a new organism, a superorganism called humanity. So the evolution is not the, the evolution we're facing now, not us. We've already evolved. The evolution is the evolution of the community of humans. And it's interesting because that's what, what we're seeing right now is how is that coming together? And I say, ah, most important recent advance is called the internet reason. The internet is a nervous system that can connect seven billion human cells into one organism. I say, look what's going on around the world. Borders are breaking down. The communities are breaking down. People are wanting a better world. A the better consciousness world. is raising. Because the internet has shown them. I mean, if you lived in, uh, in some place in the desert in the Mideast, and you're just making it day by day, scraping by, and you turn on the internet, and you see these people in, in Australia, New Zealand, North America, England living, and you go, wow, look at their lives. What am I doing in a sand pile? <laughs> and all of a sudden, they're not happy. Arab Spring says, we are, are being, you know, we're losing out on life because we can see everybody else's life. In your own country, Bernie Sanders waking people up about Thank the media. Thank Look, uh, questions about the media, about politics, all sorts of things. So this is where human evolution is headed now. We need to work together. John, John, do you have some thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely, because it goes even further than this, because our brain is, its major capacity is like a, a transmitter of information coming in and out. So it's downloading like a computer, and that's morphogenetics. There's a whole way, different way of defining it. It's Carl Jung's collective consciousness. And as Bruce says, this aggregated consciousness, which is not working at a metabolic level, it's working at a higher level, a, a quantum level of information exchange. So, uh, so that's basically what we're trying to do with clients once we got them through a stage past survival into a thrival environment. And Bruce can talk later on if he's interested in, in Rupert Sheldrake's work of morphogenetics, where you, or the 100 monkey principle, but where you start to get groups of people becoming way more cooperative at a much higher level of performance and potentiality. I, and I that's know, ultimately what I we're trying we're to do. I don't time on this in a minute, but I would like to add something very important. I love it. Is that um, if you look at the human uh, evolution and, and, and the planet, uh, and you look at them like archaeologists and you say, you know, for about 200,000 years or plus, when they dig up an archaeological site where earlier people lived for 200,000 years, they had the same tools, the same things were found at every site. Human never, for 200,000 years, were, the, were essentially the same. 30,000 years ago, all of a sudden, humans changed, technology came in. And today the technology is like vertical, that today, while we're talking, there's new technology that we'll find out tonight. And I go, what was relevant? What was the increase that we were 200,000 years staying exactly the same, and then all of a sudden, 
boom, an evolution and humans jumped up. The first scientist being physical, mechanical said, oh, there was a change in genetics, so we got smarter. Or B, there was a change in nervous system that made us smarter, and now we know what the answer was. The answer was human community. Because it takes a bunch of different humans to see things in a different way, to put their information together to create something new. If you lived, there was just like three of us in a community, and I say, hey, let's build a rocket to the moon. You go, what's the moon? What's a rocket? We can't get there, whatever. And it's like, no, not three of us, you know. But let's say, for example, a number of, uh, how many people did it take to make a computer? 50,000 different people, each with small advance, collectively made a computer. What's the nature? We are coming together now in a bigger conglomeration of humans, which is called emergence, that new ideas are going to be there tomorrow that we wouldn't even think of at this minute right now. And tomorrow you might go, oh my God, the world's changed, new idea. But all dependent on us coming together like those amoeba in, in community. In community, Thank because community so. is evolution. Community is evolution. Thank you. Bruce Lipton, wonderful. Louise Thompson, it's a wonderful book, High Energy Happiness, and moreover has a very high recommendation from James Wilson. In this he says, to any doubters of the tremendous value and truth in this book, I would simply ask, have you tried doing what is written in the book? What is written in the book? The book is about my own story uh, of burning out with adrenal fatigue and um, my route back to wellness and um, it's it's not a book that you read, it's a book that you do. So it's an experiential book for other smart, busy women who've managed to burn themselves out with adrenal fatigue to work through the exercises in there to actually get themselves back to full wellness. Because I don't believe it's about managing adrenal fatigue. I think that we can fully, fully heal ourselves from it. Tell us how it works. I um, believe around adrenal fatigue that there's um, a lot of focus around the physical and so around diet and nutrition and those things. And of, co of course those things are tremendously important in terms of how we heal. Dr. Wilson's amazing supplements without which I would, I would never be back to full health. Um, but I actually believe it's about four dimensional wellness and that adrenal fatigue is not something that we catch. It's actually something that we give to ourselves. Explain that. Um, so clearly it's not intentional, <laughs> um, but um, we give it to ourselves with millions of tiny choices and the way we choose to think. Um, and so it's about being um, well in all four dimensions, so physically well, but the basis for that is emotional wellness, mental wellness and spiritual wellness. John, this would resonate with you very in much. In it? it's fully holistic. Yes. And, and I agree exactly with what... Uh, we're talking about. Yes, and so in terms of your own story, tell us, because people will be able to relate to at least parts of it. It was a pretty severe, oh, severe yes. learning that you went through. Oh yes, I don't do anything by heart. <laughs> so I had a yeah, busy full life, as most women do. Um, and you weren't averse to a party or two, no, you weren't yes. averse to staying you, out at night. You obviously have read me quite well. <laughs> I have read the um, book. <laughs> So, um, yeah, a pretty full burn the, the candle at both ends kind of life, but also um, that whole kind of high achieving, perfectionist, get everything done, don't want to let anybody down, um, juggling lots of balls kind of life. What and, were you doing as a job? Um, I was working in media. I used to run big sales and marketing teams, um, which I absolutely loved, yes. um, but very um, high pressure, deadline That's driven. That's very intense. Intense yes. environment. Um, but, you know, no different. It, it wasn't the job that made me sick, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it was the way I was thinking about my work and it was the way I was thinking about balancing all of my responsibilities. Explain that. Uh, so, you know, having feeling like I always need to be needed to be the best and that when the work is done then I can relax or I can only relax when the work is done or oh, I'll just stay late and finish this report and then I'll go to yoga another day and then the day would never come. You so see I Louise I think so many people oh. would relate to this everybody now is pushing themselves harder because of the uh, even the technology it means oh. we're, we're on we're available all the time. Available all the time and I speak uh, a lot to big big groups of, of women um, because it's my mission to stop other women getting as sick as I actually managed to be bedridden sick I couldn't work for over a year um, tell us about that how serious was it I was so so ill um, that I couldn't even dress myself 
Wow. It mm. crept up on you or was it, it a sudden, a sudden no, drop? No, it was creeping up for years um, and I had, you know, every blood test under the sun, nothing wrong, nothing wrong, everything's normal, everything's normal. But what were you feeling, tireder and tireder, was it? Incredibly tired and particularly in the mornings, getting out of bed in the morning was like a Herculean task and nothing would happen till I'd had a, a coffee. It was just, you know, I, I just, I had no energy. Um, headaches all the time, I started feeling sick all the time, all my hair started falling out. Um, I had cuts that wouldn't heal, like all my wound healing ability had gone. And um, what about emotionally? I was emotionally? dizzy every time I stood up. My blood pressure was 80 over 49. Wow. Yeah. And, and what about emotionally? How was I was that? just, I was absolutely wrecked because I kept being told I was normal, but yet I knew this was absolutely not normal for a woman my age. Um, you know, I felt like I was going mad actually because there seemed to be no answers and that was when I stumbled on, on the work of um, Dr. Wilson and read about adrenal fatigue and ticked like every single box possible and that was the start of turning, turning everything around. Surf bums don't get adrenal fatigue. No. So all of my clients um, are smart, smart, busy women. That's why the book's called what it's called. They're smart, mm. busy, high achieving, perfectionist, very capable uh, women that are juggling lots of responsibilities. Well, I want to take issue. I think this is a book for men and women, actually. I oh. think you're being a bit sexist well, there. Well, I have about 20% of my clients are guys. Yes, because um, there are many men who are, are on this burn-up but not yeah. talking about it. Yeah, and they, yeah, they don't talk about it, and they're great clients because they really do the work. They're very like, oh, okay, you're giving me tools. I do these, I get better. And just seeing them reverse it and getting their energy back so quickly, it's just, it's so powerful. I, I just, I love what I do. So, and, and I like that it is aimed at women because women often lead the way to to health yeah. and families. So what are you seeing, the reversals, through the use of your book? What's happening? Yeah, well, I, I teach people tools that are, are cognitive tools so that they can learn to think differently about their work, about their home, about themselves, about self-esteem, about Give me confidence. an example of that. For instance, you know, I had a wonderful mum of four who had managed to completely burn herself out, working full-time as well. Um, and doing the lunch, dinners, breakfasts for the four boys and um, the husband. Um, and trying to be the super mum. Trying to be super mum, couldn't work out why she couldn't lose weight. So, so tired. Um, and uh, <laughs> one of the things that we got to is it was driven actually by a really deep belief that she wasn't there for her, she was there for them. Okay? And so she'd had a really serious car accident when she was, when the boys were very, very little. And she was saved, and she remembers looking at these four tiny boys in hospital and thinking, well, I'm not here for me, I'm here for them, that's why I've been <laughs> saved. And then 15 years later, these are all seriously grown-up men in the house, but none of them are even making their own breakfast because she couldn't prioritise her own well-being because she believed at that base, base level. She wasn't here for herself, she was here for them. That is so recognisable. Yeah. So what did you yeah. do with her, Louise? How did you get her back? Oh, we did some, we did some really deep work around changing that belief um, to I'm not here. <laughs> well, actually for her, it was this is my time. You know, I mean, these were all lads in their teens to 20s now. Um, and so doing some deeper uh, work around in, changing emotionally the decisions that she was making and then also some logistical and practical stuff like a rotor in the house that two of the boys clean up and wash up one night and the other two do it the other night so that she was only actually cooking two nights out of the seven husband's night quickly became takeaway night yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right which worked really well for everyone so yeah. it's a mix of deep um, emotional and cognitive and spiritual tools plus getting that practical element in as well, because we need it to work in the real world, right? Because people are busy. And that's a huge arc, yet you seem to have encapsulated that with the exercises and the ideas and the paragraphs in this book. It's wonderful, high energy happiness. Thank you so much, Louise Thompson. Three of the main factors in modern life are sleep, fatigue, and immunity. We've got Chrissy in the hotel at the moment. It's gonna help you, Chrissy, with the fatigue you've been experiencing, help you sleep tonight, improve your immunity. Added benefits is it's going to actually help uh, you improve your skin quality and anti-aging. If you'd like to go in the draw for this, go onto our Facebook page and follow the instructions. So joining us from Tucson, Arizona by Skype is James Wilson. Welcome James. Could you just tell us a little bit more about how the 
fatigue throughout the Western world is, has become such an enormous health issue. About 75 to 80 percent of doctors uh, hear fatigue as one of the primary complaints that people have when they come into their office. But this is a very specific type of adrenal uh, fatigue. The adrenal fatigue has its own specific energy pattern. Difficult to get up and feel fully awake in the morning, needing coffee and cola to get going and stay going during the day, sometimes many cups of coffee, oftentimes a low around 9.30 or 10, feeling better after their lunch, their, their noon meal, having a low in the mid-afternoon between 2 and 4, 3 and 5, that can be as mild as simply wanting to sit for a few minutes, as severe as having to lie down for up to an hour and a half. Then it's like a magic clock happened, a magic key is switched at 6 o'clock. They feel better, more energetic than they felt during the rest of the day. That lasts until about 9.30 or 10. They got a mild tiredness, but a lot of these are type A people, so they fight through that fatigue. At 11 o'clock p.m., they get a second wind, and they go to 1 or 2 in the morning, and then we find that if they persist and they go to bed about 1 or 2 in the morning, and they sleep in 1 to 2 hours after they're supposed to get up in the morning, they feel much more refreshed than if they get up at the time they're supposed to. Now, of all those people that go to the doctors, about 70 to 80 percent of that 70 to 80 percent are going to be suffering from adrenal fatigue, not just a regular fatigue pattern. You don't see that with thyroid fatigue. You don't see that with intestinal toxicity. You don't see that with lack of sleep. You see that only, that energy pattern only with adrenal fatigue. That's fascinating. The, the whole coffee culture that we have now is almost like thrashing an almost dead horse, isn't it? People are exhausted, adrenally, possibly adrenally fatigued, and they're trying to push themselves with coffee instead of giving what you would advise, the, the nurture for the adrenals. These aren't the people that say, I love to have a little cup of coffee in the morning. These are people that say, give me that coffee. I'll give me another one. Yeah, and then 9.30 or 10, give me another one. And they'll often spike it with a donut or uh, some other sweet or salty snack to help try to get that blood sugar back up again. Because when we're talking about adrenal fatigue, we're also talking about blood, low blood sugar because cortisol, one of the major hormones, drives blood sugar. It's the one that helps blood sugar stay calm and even in your bloodstream to give you the energy. So the minute one can feel under stress, I'm talking about myself, when, when I used to feel under stress, I would reach for some fruit or some sugar hit, even if it was a natural sugar, I needed that sugar. Yes. That's a that's good right. sign of it. And that's because your adrenals couldn't keep up and give you the new sugar that you, through the liver that you needed to keep you steady. That's right. When I was in practice, I could reach, I, I reached only a certain level of wellness with people. I couldn't get them beyond a certain amount where they had to maintain them. When I finally discovered Adrenal Rebuilder, what Adrenal Rebuilder is, is a multiglandular hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, and gonadal tissue that's combined hormone-free, by the way, hormone-free, and that provides the raw material for the gland to repair itself. And when those glands repair themselves, it may take six months, may take a year, may take even in some cases up to two years, but then those people don't need those products anymore. This is not for life. This is for one to two years. If they simply take other things and try to, try to stimulate themselves, this is a lifelong problem. If they take care of it properly and the Adrenal Rebuilder is that key, then they will uh, be able to recover in most cases and they won't need these products anymore. Now, these other products are supportive and very important, but the Rebuilder is the key. So it's a synergetic uh, process, isn't it? You've got the vitamins, the minerals, the herbs. Yeah, it's a synergy of them all. Yeah. The, it's certainly a gestalt, but the whole is much more than the sum of its parts. So it's, it's, it's called the Adrenal Quartet, isn't it? That's right. That's why we called it. it it's so uh, people sometimes say, well, which one should I start with? You start with yeah. all four, all four because yeah. they each have their own yeah. different purposes. The and herb James, adrenal, yes. James, it seems so extraordinary that such simple herbal mixtures and, and very well put together um, can make such profound differences. Could you tell us some of the stories of the enormous differences you've seen in people who've stuck to these for some time, who've really taken them daily, three times a day if necessary? Oh, certainly. I, I've had uh, a doctor who quit practice because he spent over a million dollars trying to find out what was wrong with him, and he closed his practice at 62, was able to open his practice again and have a successful practice with, with these products. I've, I've had uh, a, a fellow doctor in New Zealand who said, uh, the first time he heard me lecture, I'm your poster boy for adrenal fatigue. 
I'm thinking of closing my practice because I simply can't continue anymore. I said, please take these products. He says, well, they look, just look like a bunch of the usual things. And I said, well, why don't you try them and see? He came back to me two years later. He says, you told me at some point in the future I wouldn't need them. I've just uh, finished triathlon at, at under 55, and we've broken every record. And now I'm, un, I'm going to be 55, and I'm going to smash those records. And I don't need your products anymore, but they were essential to me uh, uh, recovery. So I hear that over and over again from doctors especially, but I hear that from single mothers who can't function on their own. I hear that from uh, lawyers who are ready to give up practice. I hear that with caretakers who have breakdowns repeatedly, and when they start taking our products, then they start going. Athletes who are failing, who are not doing well in their athletic competition, that once they uh, get on our products and do the protocol that we suggested with the quartet, then they find themselves recovering, they will compete, and then compete stronger than they've ever been, especially in the ones that require more stamina and endurance. So it just goes on and on and on. All kinds of walks of life, every kind of demographic you can think of when adrenal fatigue is involved, and they'll know that by that energy pattern I was talking about before. When they're tired in the morning, have the low in the afternoon, second wind at night, feel better if they sleep in in the morning, they know they have adrenal fatigue, and they start on that protocol, they're going to not notice that goes away little by little by little, and then at some point in the future, they're going to be able to use less and less, and they won't need the products anymore. And, and a, that's key the part, a key part of that is, the, as, as you have talked about and you write, write frequently in your book, take responsibility for your own health. Make sure that you go and talk to your doctor. Having read, for example, this book, Adrenal Fatigue, which I think should be in every home, and I've said that before, it's a Bible, take, take that to the doctor and say, I want help with this. But look at diet and look at plenty of sleep. Take responsibility in those other areas. That's true, isn't it? Absolutely. Doctors don't study health. They only study sickness. Mm. You can't go out to ask them about health. They don't know about it. They're not taught about it. But it has to be up to you. You have to take your health into your own hands. And this is one of the most powerful ways, if you have adrenal fatigue, to get yourself better and to not need these products anymore and have your life back. Thank you so much, James Wilson. And as I've said before, this book is invaluable. Adrenal fatigue, the 21st century stress syndrome, along with the medications, the treatment protocols that he has developed. Thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing. What an inspiring talk with Dr. Bruce Lipton this week about the genetic similarities of worms and humans, which wasn't expected when they began the Genome Project, and also that new science is showing the foundation of evolution to be not genetics, but rather consciousness. The next evolution has to be, as he says, the joining together of humans to share our awareness and our resources. I loved the courage of Louise Thompson sharing her journey from just mere survival to thriving after complete adrenal burnout. We have three copies of her book, High Energy Happiness, to give away on our Facebook page this week. And it was good to hear more on adrenal health from Dr. Wilson, who was also in our second show. Next week, Dr. Bruce Lipton asks where our behavior comes from. Is it from our genes or from acquired learning, from observing our parents? If you want to be a more conscious parent, this will inspire you. And we also discuss gut health and overall well-being with American naturopathic doctor Vanessa Ingram. Until then, I wish you another week of optimal health.